Factors um, on October the 7th, which is not this Wednesday, but next, um, we're going to be trying to meet outside. Um, it is going to be a shorter kind of five to seven window uh, since uh, none of our high school kids are actually on campus on Wednesdays. Um, we are going to um, try to, when, when we get a little bit better handle on what it's going to look like, we're going to try to actually uh, record those in-person live sessions. I think that'll go well. Um, but pretty standard stuff. We'll play games, have a lesson. Um, we're trying to ask the kids to have their own rides uh, to kind of cut down on the number of people who have to squeeze in the van. Uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful. The, the kids seem excited and so I think we will have, um, you know, if, if not more, at least half of what we were running because uh, they ask me about it all the time. So continue to pray for that, uh, for safety, good weather, those kind of things. Um, we also uh, good news are having trunk or treat this year. Um, I'm sure that it will look different in some capacity, um, but the Chamber of Commerce did uh, announce that they will be doing trunk or treat, so we want to participate in that. So uh, we will start candy collections now, and uh, it's October almost. So, um, so if you want to drop off candy here, we'll have it in buckets and we'll sanitize it and all that stuff. Uh, and if you have uh, good trunk ideas you want to send us as we uh, kind of plan um, that sort of thing. We, we might actually win this year because they're doing like a trunk only thing since we are pretty small, small beans. Um, a few a few prayer requests. Uh, if you would remember my aunt, uh, she was diagnosed with COVID. Um, she's fine. Uh, she's having a hard time quarantining away from her uh, grandchildren and, and her kids. She sees them about every day and then her husband's diabetic so she can't even uh, see him either. Uh, and then pray for my family because she did interact uh, with my grandmother last week and so they're better safe than sorry kind of thing and so that's why they're not here on my birthday. It's fine. It's my party. I'll cry if I want to. Um, and then um, continue to uh, pray for Brock is he went to MEPS this week and he is leaving for the Army on October 27th. And so uh, pray for safety, pray for him to get in shape because he's not. Uh, I'm not either. Um, and just uh, pray for a good direction there for, for what to do. Is uh, This has been a really good time and it's going to be gonna be hard to see him go. But uh, it'd be better than having to pay for his food and stuff. So. <laughs> uh, continue to pray for uh, me as I look for a home. Uh, Valley View has not been kind to me in my house hunt, but uh, God's got something for me. And uh, continue to pray for uh, unity as the, the global church and as a nation as we're in very divisive times. It uh, seems like everything tries to separate us, um, but it is our job as the church to be the foundation that, that holds together because Christ is above all things. And lastly, uh, we are, if you'll notice on that back table right behind you, we do have some uh, OCC stuff, Operation Christmas Child. Um, we have the shoe boxes along with the how to pack a shoebox pamphlets. So if you've never done this before, but a lot of you have, so you're pretty familiar. Uh, we have some boxes back there, but I've ordered uh, another 100, I believe. So uh, we want to fill as many as possible before November 2nd, which will be our uh, send off, our prayer service for them, and then they'll go. And um, according to what I've heard, they are going to be having um, some form of the processing center, uh, you know, because obviously these boxes need to be processed. So if there's any way that we can go, we will take a group um, and I will keep you posted on that. Um, but I did want to show just a quick video after I pray uh, that kind of talks about uh, the journey of a shoebox, what it does and, and how it impacts lives. So uh, if you will, please pray with me. Father, thank you for today and thank you for 
um, just a celebration of being together. Thank you for uh, how deeply and passionately you love us and you care for us. Thank you for um, each and every person in this room who comes uh, not um, because they have to, but instead they want to. They want to share and they want to celebrate um, what they have in common with these other people, which is the, the grace that you've shown us. Let us continue to be people who impact our community with that gospel message. Let us be people who set aside our differences and instead uh, live for the one truth that is Jesus Christ. Let us never forget that you were above all things and you're watching over us during this uh, scary time of viruses and of um, political unrest and all these things, Lord. And, and just let us never forget to encourage one another and continue meeting together. We love you so much, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Samaritan's Purse as evangelists. We just don't want to just hand out a box. Children that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we want them to grow in their faith. We want to disciple them and raise up an army of young kids who can take their faith and share it with another child so that that person will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about, evangelism, taking the gospel to another generation. You shall love the Lord your God to know that you're passing on what you've learned to another person. You're not just keeping the knowledge for yourself. You feel that. You feel like, you know what, like I'm at home. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do right now. We always work through the local church. And when it's all said and done and the training's finished, these kids are going to be part of the church, going out into their communities, sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. The Greatest Journey is a great opportunity to impact the life of a child teaching children how to share their faith with their friends and family around the world, raising up an army of evangelists who can take the gospel to the next generation. Amen. Yeah. All right, that's exciting. Let's stand together and worship the Lord. A song you're very familiar with. Oh, 
oceans of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright and singing thy praises before thee I'll bow if ever I love thee my Jesus it is now Amen Yours is the kingdom O Lord and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you. Hold and on, hold on. Ah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> we got a new system, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, he, and he doesn't know where the buttons are now. <laughs> are we ready? can't very well respond if you can't see the words. <laughs> hey, we can do this. Okay. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. Amen. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to work. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you all of my days. I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. 
Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can come. We can sing of your mighty love because we've experienced it through your son, Jesus Christ. Indwelling presence of Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. Father, we pray that today you alone would be honored. Our focus would be on you through your word. Father, I thank you for the privilege you give me of sharing what you place on my heart. Father, I pray that your words would be clear and the message of life and hope through Jesus Christ that would touch our hearts and lives again. And maybe someone who's never given their heart and life to you today would be the day that they would know of your passionate love for them, the forgiveness of our sin, that they would know that, and new life through Jesus Christ. We want you to be honored. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, what are you hungry for could possibly, quite possibly be the worst question to ask children on a long road trip. <clears throat> What are you hungry for? You're either met with uh, the silence of indecision or with a torrent of different opinions. I want McDonald's. I want Arby's. No, I hate Arby's. I want nachos at Taco Casa. You always want nachos at Taco Casa. How boring. I mean, you, you know the conversation. And from there, it just kind of devolves into, you know, a uh, discussion of who always gets what or, you know, how someone is bossy or someone is picky or someone is boring. And then it basically just goes to... Uh, you know, the crazy dietary habits of each of the children. And so, goodness, it can just get crazy. It's been a while uh, since we've had those conversations. But there's also that time somewhere, sometimes on that long drive through Nowheresville, that a sign for a restaurant pops up and everyone responds in one accord. Chick-fil-A! Let's go there! And then that, what are you hungry for, that dilemma is just automatically resolved. <clears throat> now we human creatures, we are, we're hungry creations. We have appetites. And so, um, it's interesting that uh, the very first thing, I mean, our, our life kind of begins with that understanding of, of appetite. Uh, that first need of a newborn, it's for food. After you take that first breath, you cry for milk. Uh, that's what we find there. That's, that's where we are. That's, that's who has, you know, what's happened. That's how God put us together. Uh, and so life kind of begins with, with food. And uh, it turns out, though, that death comes by eating wrongly. So it was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They were surrounded by the delights when God spoke to them about what to eat. It's interesting that the very first recorded conversation between God and the crown of his creation, humanity, specifically Adam, was about food. You can find it in Genesis chapter 2. It's also important to note that Adam and Eve had appetites. They were hungry before the fall. They needed food before the fall. Uh, hunger is not a result of sin. It's the way that God created us. He created us with this, this need. Now, what we're talking about, thinking about this morning, hunger is a great metaphor for all of our appetites. And food is, is a great picture of our source of sustenance, the, what we cannot do without. Friends, the reality is what we choose to eat reveals what we have built our lives to need. What we choose to eat, the appetites that we fulfill, they come as a result of how we built our lives, what we built our lives to need. So, when the opening story of the Bible shows God setting humans in the world and directing their appetites, that sh should tell us something. And in fact, I mean, I believe that it's trying to tell us that the whole trajectory of life and death is determined by where we direct our appetites. The whole trajectory of life is 
and death are determined by where we direct our appetite. So if we begin to hunger most deeply for things that will never really satisfy us fully, then we are headed toward death. But if we feast on that which truly fills, then we're promised life. Now, as the story of God and his people continues, we find the Israelites in the wilderness hungry. <laughs> and God's provision of manna, it shows that uh, how God's people are meant to rely on him for their sustenance, for their provision, as their sustainer, as their provider. That's what that story really is all about. That God providing manna from heaven, reminding the Israelites that he is the source of their provision. And so, um, the song of the psalmist in Psalm 34, 8, where we are entreated to taste and see that the Lord is good, calls us away from feeding on that which will not ultimately fill us, sustain us. Other psalms, you go, go read them there, but they compare the steadfast love of the Lord to a, a rich feast that always satisfies our desires. Psalm 36, 8. And when it's all said and done, the picture in Revelation that's meant to evoke hope is that of a great wedding feast. And one of the last you know, some of the final words in that entire apocalyptic vision of Revelation is a call for us to come and drink. Food and drink are the most basic human needs. And they're a picture for us of our humanness. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it shows us that you and I, as human beings, we are not made to be self-sufficient. We need something from outside of ourselves in order to sustain us to nourish us, to feed us. Ultimately, we need the creator himself to nourish, to sustain, and to feed us. And in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, what we find here is God reminding the people of Israel as they've come from the wilderness and are preparing to enter into the land of promise, what does he say to them? He says, come on. Ah, so maybe it's not. Okay, <laughs> but there in Deuteronomy, what does he say? He said, uh, he, as they're getting ready to go into the land where they can raise their own food, as he's provided sustenance to this point, as they're getting ready to go in to a land where they can raise their own food, God, through Moses, tells the people that they are not to live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That reminder that we are not self-sufficient, that we have to have something outside of ourselves to sustain us, and God himself is the one who does that. We were created as hungry creatures so that we would never forget the creator. That's something that we should be reminded of every time that we say, man, I'm hungry. That means I can't sustain myself. I need something else. I need something from someone else. We can direct our hunger toward that which doesn't truly satisfy us, but when we do that, that leads to spiritual malnourishment and ultimately death. Or we can direct our hungers toward the only one who, who does fill us, the, the bread of life, the living water. Only then shall we truly live. Now, I'm fairly confident that each one of us here this morning that we have some uh, pretty good memories of uh, conversations and times shared, uh, you know, around the table. It doesn't necessarily have to be with family, it can be friends, but I'm pretty sure that all of us can remember those times, some real special times uh, that we shared uh, a common meal or that the event was centered on a meal. I know that I've got many, many, many wonderful memories of sharing meals with family and friends. I hope that you do too. And the reality is while life is more than food, life always happens at the table. At a table. Now, why do I say that? Because we are always feeding on something. We are always feasting on something. 
And the only question is whether or not it will bring life or death. Now today, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 6. Sorry. Chapter 6. We're going to be looking at that, but uh, there in uh, Mark 6, we got it there, verse 14 or so. And what we find, thinking here about what we're talking about this morning, is that there are two tables set before us. God has prepared a table for us with, through his own body and blood uh, that is our bread and our cup. And next Sunday morning, we are going to participate in the Lord's Supper, communion. We will remember that. But the Lord God has prepared a table before us with his own body and bread, blood, and the world sets a table before us with all of its delights. But I think nowhere in the Gospels is the contrast between these two banquets, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world, more stark than in Mark's Gospel. Now, both Mark and Matthew, they record the beheading of John the Baptist immediately before the feeding, Jesus feeding of the 5,000. But Mark, I believe he, he shows us the intentionality of this through a phrase that's included here. And so Mark chapter 6, you know I mean? I thought I had it bookmarked here, but uh, Mark chapter 6, there, uh, you know, like verse 14 in there, uh, but actually down in verse 21, it says, uh, the verse that kind of, like I said, makes this intentional, is a phrase there in verse 21, uh, where in the Common English Bible, which is what I'm, I'll be reading from, is that uh, Mark gave a banquet, or he prepared a feast. Now, to me, that's an interesting phrase, prepared a feast. We see that as a specific designation of what Herod was providing. But I would think that Jesus feeding 5,000 people is also a feast. And so here they are together and looking at these two feasts side by side. You can't help but notice the difference between the two kings and the kingdoms that they represent. First of all, or for one, I mean, the people involved here are vastly, vastly different. Herod prepared a feast right there in verse 21, chapter 6, verse 21. Uh, he gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of, Gen of the Gentiles, of, of, you know, of Galilee, pardon me, of Galilee. Now, this was a party for the power players. This was a party for the who's who. This was a party for the movers and the shakers. Now, Jesus, what happened with Jesus? Jesus found a crowd that had invited themselves. <laughs> uh, the people that came, they were from the, the villages of the area there, and they, they came to a place where they anticipated that Jesus and his disciples might be. And so there they were. These people, I mean, they, they must have been desperate. They were seeking something. Now, Herod was in control of his guest list. And he made sure that there were only guests that could offer him something. Only guests that could give him something that he wanted. What did Jesus find? Jesus found this uninvited crowd who wanted something from him. And yet Jesus looked at the crowd, and what do we see there in verse 34? It says he had compassion on them. Now we don't know what Herod thought about his guests. But we do know is that the girls dancing impressed Herod so much that it put him in a gift-giving mood. And in fact, he, he offered her anything that she could ask for up to half his kingdom. Jesus, on the other hand, taught the crowd many things. And then he fed them. At Herod's feast, performance was, the, was everything. Please the king and you just might get what you wanted. At Jesus' feast, compassion was everything. Compassion. Because this king, because Jesus was already full of love for his people, he gives you what you need. Have you ever noticed in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 that the people never asked for something to eat? 
but they never asked for it. Jesus knew that they were hungry, and he knew from the very beginning. They didn't have to perform for him to notice them. He, he already knew them. He, he saw them, and he loved them, that he had compassion on them. So what did he do? He fed them. He fed them teaching, his word. He taught them many things, and he fed them bread. Truly took care of them. The climactic moment in Herod's feast was someone's death. And actually not just a death, but a murder. The execution of John the Baptist was the real story of Herod's birthday party. The conclusion of Jesus' feast was abundance. There were 12 baskets of bread and fish collected after everyone had eaten and had their fill. At Herod's party, there was never enough. Never enough power, never enough control, never enough pleasure. Someone had to lose for someone else to win. Someone had to die for others to live. And even though it may not have been Herod's desire to behead John the Baptist, it sure served him, okay? That troublemaker was now gone. And you can't be too careful with those revolutionaries but at Jesus banquet there was more than enough in fact there was enough for everyone to to be filled to eat until they were full and then there was some more and, and while Herod's commands created chaos I mean uh, can you imagine a party where someone's head is brought in on a platter and what would be the result of that? While Herod's commands created chaos, Jesus, he told his disciples how to organize the crowd so that they could be fed. Herod's feast will always lead to death. Jesus' feast always ends in abundance and life. Now, at the two feasts, there were two different ways of getting an invitation or becoming a guest. There were two different ways of uh, getting a request, you know, granted or getting a need met. And there are two different ways for the story to end. The first story is about power. It's about performance and ultimately death. The first story there ends in death. The second story, the story of Jesus, it's about desperation and hunger and ultimately life. You feast with Herod and you may feel powerful, but you will be required to perform. And the result will be chaos and death. The feast with Jesus you can come desperate and needy, you can come tired and hungry, and you will be fed. You will be nourished. You will be comforted. And in the end, you will be given an abundant life. But this story isn't just a story about two feasts. It's about two kings and their kingdoms. Now Mark tells us that when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. And there in verse 34, he uses this phrase, they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Now this is significant. It's not just a throwaway line. Shepherd imagery in the Bible is intentional. It's not just a, a therapeutic image of, of care and nurture. The idea of a shepherd and the sheep. No. This was the kind of the ultimate metaphor uh, in this agrarian, this uh, agricultural society for the, the, the king, the one who was there to, to take care of them. It represented a, a physician, a protector, a provider, a guide. That's what the shepherd was. And, and so it makes sense that when Israel's poets and prophets spoke about the kings of Israel, they referred to them as shepherds. They were to be providers. They were to be physicians. They were to be protectors and guides. That's who they were. And so the poets and the prophets, that's how they referred to them. But there's one prophet, 
prophet by the name of Ezekiel, um, who, yes, he referred to the kings of Israel as the shepherds of Israel, but he had a scathing review of the kings and offered on behalf of God, he called them the shepherds of Israel, but when he accused them, he accused them of having only tended themselves. Now, I, I had Ezekiel 34 up here. If you want to turn there, you certainly can. I'm going to read a, a passage there to you. But from Ezekiel 34, God talking through Ezekiel, speaking on behalf of God here, talking about the shepherds of Israel and saying that they tended only themselves. Instead of tending the sheep, they drank the milk, they wore the wool, they slaughtered the fat animals. They didn't, as Ezekiel continues, they didn't strengthen the weak, they didn't heal the sick, they didn't bind up the injured, they didn't bring back the strays or seek out the lost. Instead, they used force to rule them with injustice. So instead of the shepherds of Israel being the, the great kings that they were called to be, they hadn't lived up to that metaphor of being a shepherd. They hadn't met the job description of a good king. They weren't protectors or physicians or providers or guides. They failed. And, and the very next verse in Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, beginning there, uh, but Ezekiel, he includes this line that Mark uses back in Mark 6. He says, without a shepherd, Ezekiel 34, 5, my flock was scattered. And when it was scattered, it became food for all the wild animals. And Mark had said they were like sheep without. Jesus saw them, had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. There's that phrase there in Ezekiel 34, 5. Without a shepherd. And the Lord declared through Ezekiel that he is against the shepherds there in verse 10. And not only that, he says that he, God, will come himself and do the job. And so picking up in Ezekiel 34, 11, Ezekiel proclaims, God proclaims through Ezekiel, the Lord God proclaims, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out the flock, when some in the flock have been scattered, so will I seek out my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered during the time of clouds and thick darkness. I will gather them and lead them out from the countries and peoples, and I will bring them to their own fertile land. I will feed them on Israel's highlands, along the riverbeds, and in all the inhabited places. And I will feed them in good pasture. And their sheepfold will be there on Israel's lofty highlands. On Israel's lofty highlands, they will lie down in a secure fold and feed on green pastures. I myself will feed my flock and make them lie down. This is what the Lord God says. I will seek out the lost, bring back the strays, Bind up the wounded and strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy because I will tend my sheep with justice. Now, why did I go to Ezekiel? Well, because hopefully we can see that the feeding of the 5,000, it's not just a, you know, a good story about Jesus doing some cute party trick. No, it is was a sign that the kingdom of God was arriving and that Jesus himself was the real king. There in Ezekiel said he would feed his flock, make them lie down. Jesus had the people to sit down and he fed them. He fed them food, bread, and he fed them his word. Jesus was himself the true king. Herod was not the real king. And Jesus' banquet was the real feast, not the feast of Herod. Jesus is the king that provides true bounty, true blessing for his people. And so the question for us today, where are you feasting? Are you at Herod's banquet hoping to satisfy yourself with some kind of power and pleasure that the world offers? Are you chasing influence uh, by trying to work real hard or fit in with the right group? Are you constantly posting on social media, hoping to get your views and your likes up so that somebody will notice you? The feast 
of that food will never satisfy, will not fill you up, leads only to chaos and death. Where are you feasting? At Herod's feast? Or are you feasting at Jesus' feast? Are you desperately following him? Are you clinging to, to every word, hungry and, and needy for what he offers? Are you opening the scriptures? Are you, are you sitting there and listening, shaping your life by the cross-shaped love of Jesus? That can only be for your good. Giving you nourishment, providing healing and, and health. That comes through Jesus Christ. And friends, the table that you choose reveals the king that you serve. Now, I don't pretend to know the circumstances of your life. I don't know if things are great with family and your house is full or you're struggling with family and you're, you're by yourself or you have a roommate. I don't know if, if things are going great with your job or you hate your job and or you don't have a job. I don't know if you see beauty in this world or you look around you and you say, where is anything beautiful in this world in which we live? I don't know if maybe you think that your life is just too plain, just too confused, too incoherent to be any kind of story at all. I, I don't pretend to know. But what I do know is that Jesus is right here. Jesus is here ready to take whatever you place in his hands, whatever you give him. These very moments of the story of your life are the moments that he wants to bless and break and give. What I know is that uh, 25 years ago, I stood on a mountainside in Colorado and placed my life in Jesus' hands and let him love me. Instead of trying to do things on my own, instead of seeking the, the power, instead of seeking approval and acceptance from the world and those around me. I accepted Jesus' invitation to come. Let me bless you, break you, and give you for the life of the world. And because of what happened 25 years ago, I stand before you today. Are you ready to place your hand, your life in the hands of Jesus? Are you ready for him to, to bless you, to remind you of your identity in him? To, to break you? To take that drive for the things of this world and redirect them and so that you can be given for the life of the world? Come to the king's table. Place your life in his hands, your whole story. Let him give you what truly fills. Let me, him give you abundance, life. I hope that as we've thought about being blessed, broken, and given for him, that we are ones who can now even pray, Jesus, I'm yours. Bless me, break me, give me, take my story and make it sacred. Make it more than it could ever be without you. Make me blessed, make me broken, make me given for the life of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Is that what you want to do today you, you can hopefully you, you already have 
Even through this, you said, yes, that's what I want to do. Give my life to him. Even if you've, you've done that, uh, you're a Christian. Friends, it's something that you continue to do. Recognize his claim on your heart and life. As you say, yes, today, Jesus, I want you to be honored through how I live, how I think, what I say, what I do. Bless me, break me, give me for the life of the world. Let's do that today. If you don't know him, I pray that today is the day that you say, yes, yes, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for the forgiveness that you provided me through your death and the life that I can have through your resurrection. I may not understand it all, but I give myself to you. I come and feast at your table. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love that we know through your son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for Mark. I thank you for Ezekiel. Father, and I thank you for those that you've placed around me that have impacted my life. You've used them to impact my life for you. I pray your blessings on them. I pray your blessings on those who are here today. And that, that blessing is that sense of blessedness from the very beginning. That each one of us here would, would recognize and be committed to that truth that we were created in your very image to be broken and given for the life of the world. Help us then to do that. As the world looks at us, Father, I pray that they would see something different, that they would see someone in us who's different, who loves them no matter what. And Father, may I pray each of us be drawn closer to you, the one who, who loves us no matter what, and the one who has given himself for us, and the one who says, come, join me in what I'm already doing as we change the world one heart at a time. Father, as we prepare to sing, let us lift our voices to you in thanksgiving and praise. For your son, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. And so I, I love this, this beautiful song, and this is how I wanted us to end our time together today. Rick. Let's stand together to sing Awake My Soul. Yes. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. A thousand songs are not enough to say how great you are. The glories of your majesty the triumphs of your love. Wake my soul to sing the glories of my God and King. Arise and praise the one worthy of the songs of a thousand tongues. Yes. You You break the power of all our sin. You set the captive free. You make the broken heart rejoice. New life the dead receive. Awake my soul to sing the glories of my God. Arise and praise the one worthy of the songs of a thousand tongues. Forever you are, forever you are worthy, forever you are, forever you are worthy.
melody of the songs of a thousand tongues. Awake my soul to sing the glories of my God and King. Arise and praise the one worthy of the songs of a thousand tongues. Worthy of the songs of a thousand tongues. Yes. Let's have some Judas misses, please, this morning. 